Uh, kids of four year old to fourth grade, stay where you're seated. I'm just kidding. You can dismiss. Yeah, junior church. You were just too excited. No, wait, 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 wait. You don't have to go. Oh, nice job. At least fake it. You don't have to be that excited. Oh, isn't that sweet? Oh, I think I'm going to. See you guys. That is awesome. All right. All right. They don't have to go. They can stay. We have fun in here. Not as much fun as they are having down there. Um, it's very nice to see if you have a Bible you could turn to. Joshua 10 is where we are. We just did a brief three-week series on prayer. As we move forward, we want to move forward with, with prayer. In the first week, we spoke of through all of our struggles of prayer that we elevate the prayer of, help me to be a good, bold witness to Jesus through all of this. That's what Paul did. Then last week, and I'm still thinking a lot about last week, let's pray for those who can't pray for themselves or pray for those that won't pray for themselves. And that could be some of our worst enemies. I mean, really against you. The professor or teacher who clearly has it out for you, and who knows why, that our prayer for them is one of protection, that God would enlighten their heart. Not that they would just be nice to you, but that they would be enlightened with the gospel. And then today is, a, is, is like a big prayer. Today is that we raise the level on what we pray for. Like, to understand, and here's the key, that when we understand who God is and we have a clear grasp on the greatness of God, it raises the level of our prayers. We pray bigger. We actually pray based on our view of God. Small view of God, small prayers. Big view of God, big prayers. There are about 650 prayer or prayer statements in the Bible, and they're fascinating because they're, they're the gamut of, um, of content, and many of them are out of extraordinary circumstances, and we can look at them and to see why and how they're praying the way that they are. And I think a common theme is when we understand that God really is limitless, our requests of Him will be different. It's not, oh, this is asking a lot of you. So I was in Israel this last, uh, just this past spring, um, and before I went, it was the first trip I've gone. I've been there many times. Uh, the first trip I went without Sarah. She, had to, she, she teaches online with Arizona State University, so it just didn't coincide, and so she had to stay back. And I wanted to take $500 cash in small bills just packed in my pockets, just that every time I lift up, there's money. And it seemed like a lot, still does. And I thought, the best way to get that past her we were in the kitchen, Ross, he's 20, he's in the kitchen, and I said to him, but Sarah could hear me, I said, hey, Ross, I'm going to the bank today, going to grab 1,500 bucks in cash, take with me to Israel. Sarah about broke her neck looking over. She goes, what? And I said, what? No, I just need to make sure that I, I was overseeing a large group, 150 people, and so I had to oversee, and I wanted some cash. She goes, no, I said, actually... Actually, I'm just taking 500 out. And she goes, oh, that's fine. See the trickery there? 500 was sounding like a lot until we upped the ante to, to, uh, to 1,500. I think we can do that when we look at the prayers in the Bible. We look at some of them. They are so huge. And we're like, this is, like, how did you think to ask for that? I know how. You have a really clear view on how spectacular God is. Outrageous. Can't, can't uh, quantify it. He's so big. 
And the more we immerse ourselves in growing in our knowledge and understanding of him, our prayers increase with them. We'll see that in Joshua 10. And let me pray for us. Father, I'm asking if you would please enlighten our hearts on this passage. And maybe affect our prayers today, Heavenly Father, as we look at a spectacular incident that you've recorded for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Joshua 10. I'm not sure that you can get a larger prayer request than this one. If you look at Joshua 10, middle of the story, verses 12 and 13, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. This is what was going on, is this is right after Jericho. This was after A, which is uh, kind of where they are right now in that same area. It's, um, it's just uh, east of Jerusalem along the um, Jordan River is where Jericho is, and it's just above that. 20 miles is all they had to go. They had to go 20 miles as an army, but as they were going, they were getting word that five kings and kingdoms are going to meet them there. Now, back then, Israel wasn't like one kingdom. When it says going to go get the Canaanites, you know, every city was its own kingdom. Jericho was its own kingdom. And so five major cities and those kings, who didn't always get along, all came together and they were going to meet up. Not only was it a 20-mile hike, it was uphill. If you're in the Jordan, you're going up. It's higher than Jerusalem, or as high, and then down in. It's 3,300 elevation change. Well, Joshua is just simply doing the math. We're going to get there, and we're going to be out of daylight, and we're exhausted. What do I do? How in the world did he think this was an idea? I didn't know this would be an option. He didn't even just ask, you know what we could do is, you know, we could just get more daylight. And I'm sure his guys were like, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. I just wrote that down. If we could have a longer day today, then we would be okay. No, they had no idea. And I don't know, I don't know how, it says that it ceased. I don't know if it's talking like the way we do with sun rises and sets, the sun doesn't move, we are moving, but it's just saying it as in, I don't know, it is slow down like a lot where we added another day. I was going to title this today, uh, Prayer 48-7, 48 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm glad I didn't, because apparently that's not funny. Huh. Yeah, I'm a, let me make a note to never call it that, because that wasn't, that wasn't even, no reaction on the 48-7. Bad idea. Stick to notes. Okay. I don't know, so I don't know how that transpired. And obviously, if you're going to stop the sun, there's tidal waves, because I've seen Bruce Almighty as maybe you have too if you move the moon. So I, I get all of that, and obviously God took care of all of that. But my favorite part of this verse is uh, the, uh, the end of 12 when it says, And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand still. He went public on this. This wasn't quietly praying, you know, God, if, um, hey, between me and you, buds, if you can stop the sun, and then God go, that's a horrible idea. Okay, no, I thought maybe it was plan B. In the sight of Israel, he went in front of everybody and said, sun, stand still. We need more time here. And it did. This is outrageous. There are, just so that we know, there are 
uh, legends in people groups about this type of a thing. It's a fascinating study academically. It's not verified, you can go on Snopes, it's not verified that they found the missing day or it, it's not that extreme. Same as the flood. In northern Arizona, there's a wonderful tribe of people called the Hopi Indians. They're kind of with the, uh, kind of uh, geographically alongside of the Navajo. And the Hopis have a legend in their history of a flood. As you may know, there are hundreds of those kinds of legends. Isn't that fascinating? Well, of course. I mean, it was a big deal. So was this. Because it didn't just stop there, it stopped everywhere. So there you are, a long ways away in a people group that is, has nothing to do with Israel, and that day is a little extra long. And you're like, this is weird. Other side of the earth, that was a long night's sleep. How did that happen? Well, it was enough that there are stories and legends of this actually taking place. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, it makes me wonder, why are we not seeing more happen with the gospel of Christ in this world? I, I bet you we could answer that. Well, God's not ready. It's his timing. Okay, yeah, let's, we could blame him for a while. That's, that's, I get it. Fair game, sovereignty. I understand those things. However, how many of us are praying fervently to the Lord that the dictator of North Korea comes to know Jesus? Uh, that's pretty big. No, actually, it's not any different than having somebody of your neighbor come to know Christ. Would that be a game changer? Not, not sat and prayed a prayer. I'm talking about in heart conversion. That's a game changer. That's pretty big. It's not big. That's not big. God would say, oh yeah, let me, let me just run through. I have X number of prayers offered to me on a daily basis. I'll show you this graph. And that prayer, very, very seldom. And you're geographic. South Korea, they pray it. But that's funny. No, a lot of their prayers are vindictive against him. Hmm. How big is our God? How big is he... What is he capable of doing? Now, I'm not sure that today uh, stopping the sun is going to accomplish, you know, a whole lot. I mean, we could have used it uh, last week with the softball. We could have had more sunshine, and we could have played softball. Was that last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Really? Really? No I'm, no, I'm sorry to wake you. I, I mean, I know you were, just, you were just in that sweet spot of sleep. So I didn't, I mean, I hate, you're like, oh, he did it again. At least I didn't yell in the microphone. You know what that means. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure that that would benefit anything. But what is it that we're asking? He's big. There's a passage in 2 Kings 4, and I think of this one a lot. 2 Kings 4, you know the story. I'll just summarize it really quick. A prophet died, and his widow is poor, owes a lot of people, lots of debt, no food, goes to Elijah, help. And he says, gather together from all your neighbors empty vessels. Get as many empty vessels as you can. Gather them all together. And he says, okay, shut the door, start pouring. And limitless oil filled all of the vessels. Isn't that great? But the text actually, then when you see, it's Second Kings. I guess I do want to read one, one part of that. It's Second Kings 4, 6. 
it's kind of fascinating. It's end of verse 3. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Oh, that's going to be on them. How many? Not too few. Okay. So they did it in verse 6. Bring me another vessel. Filled it. Bring me another vessel. There aren't any more. And the oil stopped. What does that tell us? It is crystal clear. Her vision of how many empty vessels was the limit of what she was going to get. It said it twice. Don't bring too few. That's on you. You get as many vessels as you want. Go collect them. And I will fill every one of them. That's what he turned out doing. What would have happened if there were 10 more vessels? According to this text, I'm going to go out and just pure text, they would have all been filled. The blessings of God, answers to prayer of God, are limited by us, not by him. And you say, oh, now we're getting a prosperity theology. No, I'm talking just prayer. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying values in prayer. And this was actually oil. This was her livelihood. She then went and sold oil and paid off a lot of her debt, or all of her debt. What did she do with the extra? Banked it. And so I'm thinking of that text, and it's so good for us. Then I see the extension of what Joshua did, and I'm like, how did you... Th that is just a crazy... Why don't you have prayed that I wish all five kings show up and they're all drunk? That would have been pretty good. That would have worked. That could have been hilarious, actually. I pray that the five kings get lost. I pray that they all turn on each other. That's happened before. And that they kill each other and we can just sleep because we are exhausted. Uh, a pretty good idea. I can think of a lot of ways that aren't quite so extravagant as in front of everybody, sun, stand still, moon, don't move. And then it happened. There's a wonderful little book, an author that I really enjoy is J.B. Phillips. Are you familiar with the J.B. Phillips Bible translation? It's a wonderful little, probably 70s, no, 60s. Uh, it was C.S. Lewis was the one who told him he got a copy of like some of J.B. Phillips's translation. And C.S. Lewis said, that is some of the best translation I've ever seen. Keep going, keep going. So it's the J.B. Phillips translation. J.B. Phillips suffered with depression his whole life. In fact, right about the time of his death was when his wife published, it might have been after death, a book called The Wounded Healer. That's where that phrase came from. Uh, Henry Nowen has a book called The Wounded Healer. J.B. Phillips, it was the fact that this guy did so much good, but he was so broken mentally. How did he pull this off? Setting up for the title of this one fantastic book of his, written in 1952, called Your God is Too Small. It was pretty good insight. He saw everything going on in the church, and you're going, you know what, I think I know one of the problems here. Oh, yeah, we're not walking with the Lord. We're not praying enough. We're not. He goes, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, probably true, all that. No, your God is way too small. You have a mental picture of God that is very limited. And then he goes through types of allegorical things, like when we say Father. Well, you, yes, God is our Heavenly Father, but by tagging Father on, you have it also, it's an aspect of God. It isn't. So it's limited. He's a shepherd, good shepherd. Yep, he is. He is all of that. That's a good example. The Bible uses it. It's a window into who God is. But you want to see who God is? You're going to cover your face and you're going to, I do not deserve to be here. Remember Isaiah 6? 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the place shakes. That's him. C.S. Lewis in, uh, in his uh, book, The Chronicles of Narnia, speaks of the lion. And the lion is the Jesus character in the book. And I think it was Lucy who was like, look, it's like, look, he's so great. And the line, and I don't recall the character that said it, it was like, whoa, he's not a tame lion. That's the line. Oh, he's not a tame lion. Don't box him in to think, oh, he just walks with me and talks with me. Oh, he does, but he's also king of kings and lord of lords. Be careful. Walk carefully. Ecclesiastes, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Don't go offer sacrifice of fools. There's this balance. Oh, he is loving. He is father figure. But I'll tell you that he has, he has a demanding presence. He does not like sin at all. And when it's in you and me, he will remove it. And he may do it harshly. I don't know what it takes. I would think that if the church won the lottery, that would be a good thing. Maybe not. Your family member that's in jail, I would love for that family member to be out of jail. I really would. And it's in a lot of our families, so this isn't just out there, it's us. And so we pray, God, you're amazing, you're great. Can you shake the foundations of the prison and set them free? There's a big assumption there. The assumption is that that's a good idea. We don't know. You're praying for a healing. He absolutely can heal. Easy. Easy. That might not be the answer, though. Yeah, God's will might be the best if he takes him home. But I don't understand it. No, you wouldn't. Remember how big he is? Of course you don't understand it. So when we say we're praying big prayers, we take the scriptures and we pray big prayers that have value. Oh, I'm going to pray that everyone's debt's removed. I would love that. That'd be so freeing, wouldn't it? And God goes, yeah, that'd be kind of neat, but I'd rather him learn the principles of spending. I'd rather him learn how to live. I'd rather him learn things. And more money doesn't bring happiness. Oh, yeah, I guess it doesn't. Yeah, it can ruin a lot of people. So big prayers, but what big prayers? What do we pray? So as you look in your notes there, there's only two points today. Isn't that nice of me? Doesn't it sound like it's going to be brief? You're like, oh, that means it's two-thirds the normal length. Yeah, no, that's right. That would be a God-sized prayer. And false hope is at least hope. So you can just kind of sit with that for a minute. So keep this prayer request in mind, which was, sun stands still. And I don't know. That's big. That's a lot of weight on one text. Not that far from Jerusalem. I'll mention Israel again. Uh, just, uh, just south and a little east is one of Herod's palaces called Herodium. Has anyone been to Israel? Anyone? Yes, good. We'll need to get a trip going, right? We do. Um, Herodian, uh, he, Herod built Masada, if you know of Masada. There's a great old movie about that. Uh, Herod built Caesarea Maritime, this harbor that was just outrageous. This is all the time of Jesus. He built Herodium, and if you look at it online, it looks like a big anthill. It's the largest peak in the area southeast of 
Jerusalem. And you see it when you're coming. I mean, it's hard to miss it. It's spectacular. Well, he built the mountain to build the palace on. He took smaller hills around and through slave labor, of course, moved them all and built this massive, and you can't see the palace because it's down in like an anthill. That is likely what Jesus was referring to when he was talking about faith as a mustard seed and you can move this mountain. It's probably what he was referring to. You have faith. You can do anything. Look what Herod's doing. Even Herod just moved that thing. He literally moved a mountain and then built on top of it. Masada is unbelievable. It's unbelievable what he had up there. It was in, It was the last stand of Israel when it was conquered in AD 70 by the Romans. This is, this is the last stand. It was up in the middle of nowhere. Luxurious. How does this happen? Because there's no limit to the mind. Herod, as a pagan, <clears throat> knew if I can think it, I can do it. And Jesus said, oh, if you have faith, you can do anything. You, you literally can do anything with faith. Why is it we don't have? He answered that. You have not because you ask not. You're limiting yourself by not asking. And theologically, many of us say, yeah, but you've got to be really careful of what you're asking for because it's have not, ask not, but you're not asking that you can just have it in vain. Ah, uh, remember that? All these little technicalities. And I'm going to tell you, when, uh, when our kids, when they would come up to me and they ask me a question, I don't judge the theological accuracy of them asking me. It's heart to heart. Mom's out of town for the weekend. Kids come to me. Dad, let's have ice cream for breakfast. I don't, I'm not offended going, okay, you're, you're outside the lines right now. That is not what you're supposed to be asking for. Oh, okay, because I'm just supposed to ask for... They're not learning that. They're learning my heart. I'm listening to their heart. It was Charles Finney, the great revivalist, that said, words in themselves do not please or displease God in a prayer. He looks at the heart. Say it wrong. Doesn't matter. He's looking at the heart. What are we asking for that's huge? What is there that we as a church, what do we want to accomplish in this community? Because we're limited by one thing, ourselves. He can do anything. He has big plans. Yeah, but you don't want to just grow for the sake of growing. Yep, here we go again. Yeah, go ahead and look at all the exceptions and all the excuses to not ask that we want everyone in town to know that if you want a dose of the Holy Spirit, you want to be loved in your sin, go to ALBC. They love everybody. Yeah, but I'm kind of involved in something. Oh, yeah, you tell them, the more sin you show, the more they're going to love you. Is that not what we want? We want to be the most non-judgmental group that just throws our arms around people and say, come, I want to introduce you to my Savior because he changed my life, and I know he can change your life. And I'm not even suggesting you need it. I'm just saying, I need it, and I'd love you to meet him. That's, that's big vision. That's God's vision. What does he want from us? I had a friend walk uh, down the hallway at our church. There are nine pastors on staff, and so kind of a couple hallways. And she stuck her head in. This was December. She stuck her head in, literally, like just, hey, pastor, I got to get rid of some money by end of the year. So any request you have, send it to me. And I'm like, okay. She literally went to every door down the hall. Well, and I'm like, wow, okay. At the time, I'm teaching about 100 people on Tuesday night, every Tuesday night, 
I didn't have a laptop. I wanted to do PowerPoint. It sure would be nice if I had it, about a grand, 1500 I don't know, something like that. Then all the pieces to get it to work and whatever. So I checked back with her, and I said, um, I said, you know, I actually, I do. She goes, yeah, yeah, hit me. And I told her. She said, she goes, okay, pastor, please don't nickel and dime me. Oh, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand that. She goes, yeah, yeah, you've got that. But I want you to tell me what you need to see that the gospel's stronger here. Please ask. That's what I do to God. My prayer requests are so small. It's like, do you not know who you're talking to? So she, she just for me, she gave 150000 just Just to my... But she sat with me, and she actually helped me dream. She goes, you're doing trips, like, f with evangelism all over the place. I said, yeah, we're in the Caribbean. We're, we go to Europe. And she goes, more people need to go. We need to do more of that. She goes, so 25's for that. And then she started explaining and getting me to think and dream. And I'm like, yeah, you're teaching me. It's not about the money. You're teaching me how to not limit myself. I don't want to be limited. Why would we live that way with our family? Why would we live this way when we have a God who loves us, a God who is unlimited? Why not ask? And then in the conversation, when I say to him, as is so common of a parent and myself, I'm in the front of the line, when I say, God, just... Please, and I'm all my heart, please protect my kids and keep them healthy. We pray that for our families all the time. You know what? I want that too. I do. I want your family safe, and I want your family healthy. But I also know that that may ruin them. A health challenge might be what's in order here. So my heart grows with God, and I try to enlarge my understanding of Him, and my large prayer requests change. I wasn't going to tell this story, I was just going to. It was a Christmas Eve. I always sent the office out on Christmas Eve. They're, they're done at noon, and I stay and I answered the phones. Uh, my predecessor did that, and so we had an office of about 30 of us, and we sent them all home, and I just sit at the front, and I answer the phone. This couple, they are with a uh, fellowship of Christian athletes. Cool couple. They called to meet with me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's Christmas Eve. I'm here. They said, we're going to come in. We're excited. So they came in, and they really are wonderful two people. And they sat, and she was a little giddy. She was pretty excited to be sitting there about something obvious. And I said, so what? And she goes, okay. God, God wants us to tell you that your son is going to be healed. Our son was just at the time going through his blindness, and it was setting in, and it was difficult for everybody and more for him. But the progression of the disease was long enough, started when he was seven. At this point now, he's 12. So we have already grown and learned so much about God. It was one of the few times that on the spot I said the right thing. I mean, it just, she's all excited. She says, I'm here to tell you that we've been praying and God has told us that your son is going to be healed. And I said, of what? And I meant it. Of what? And they were like a little like, uh-oh, what? Well, isn't he, isn't he blind? Oh, oh, that. Well, I'd really value your prayers that my son would renounce selfishness and sin. because that's my prayer for him. Would you pray that for me? And she goes, well, but he's, her husband, her husband grabbed her knee, said, honey, honey, 
stop. And we sat. I'm like, do you really think that that illness is his biggest problem? Very good friend of mine there. The kid's gay, moves to New York City, and he's a great kid. And I talk to the parents a lot, and the wife says, you know, my prayer for my son is exactly the same prayer that you have for your kids. The value is that my son knows God, faith in Jesus Christ, and lives in a thriving relationship with God. That's my prayer. Because everyone asks, what do you pray? He's gay. Is, is he born that way? Is he? And it's all become the conversation. That's not the conversation. That's not the problem. The problem's in our heart. The problem are value things. They're things of love and compassion. I want a kid who loves the Lord, that renounces sin and walks this moral ground. And Grant, Grant, He's known in the family as the moral compass. I'll say something at dinner, and my daughter loves it, and she adds to it, and it's, it's not appropriate. <clears throat> and Grant just shakes his head. He goes, you guys, stop. And we're like, oh, Mr. High Ground. And then we all laugh and make fun of him because he's got this moral compass about him. He loves the Lord so much, and he loves people so much that I think... Probably having his sight back would have ruined him. Well, I think it's obvious because God didn't heal him. Still could. I'd love for him to see the face of his wife. I would love that. Learn how to drive. Well, he, as he says, he goes, oh, Dad, I drive. I just don't drive legally. We used to go out in the desert. And we say, go. And I'm like, no. And he's laughing. We're going over stuff. And we pray values. You say, well, how, how, do, you, how do we do this? And I'll, I'll, just, I'll, take, I'll take one with us. Just as an application of large prayer. 1 Timothy 2. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Timothy 2. Here's a great one. They're everywhere. When in doubt, are we praying God's will or not? When in doubt? Pray God's will, word, because that's his will. So 1 Timothy 2. I don't know what your theology is. doesn't matter. Let's see. 1 Timothy 2. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayer, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in high positions, that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in godliness, dignified in every way. Here it is. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what we want. God, I... I want this family member to know you. I want this neighbor, this guy that works in my car. I want my hairdresser. I want them to know you. God, I, I'm claiming that this is, you said. How about that for boldness? You said it's your will that all would be saved. God, I'm begging you. I'm begging that they would come to know you and they would walk with you. No, it's pleading. Your grandkids, I want your grandkids safe. I would love it if your grandkids never come home from school and get beat up after school. I would love that. That would be really nice. I have no idea, though. I don't know what God's will is for the health of your grandchild. I don't know why he moves people out of a home. Why does, why does he allow houses to be split up or people to be taken away? I don't understand any of those things. I never will, and yet I will always look to him and say, you are huge, you are so big, you are so wise, you are so in control, nothing surprises you. I hate, hate that this happened, but I trust you. I trust you. I'm, I'm mad about it. 
but I trust you. And he goes, come here. I'd be mad too. And you're right, trust me. But God, I know you want my grandkids to know you. I know you want my kid to know you. I know that because of this, ver you said it. And I'm begging and pleading with you that they would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'll end with this one quick story. Um, I've been getting texts while I'm here from a friend of mine. His name's John Burley. He's a, such a nice guy, good friend. Um, he's m my link with Nick Wojcik. You know Nick Wojcic, the no arms, no legs guy? You've seen him, Australian guy. My friend John's the one that found Nick at a conference. He was being pushed in a, um, a baby carriage, and he was a teenager. So I'm sitting with John right before I came here, literally a week before I came. I'm sitting with John. And we're always talking about Nick because they see each other all the time and they're friends. And my buddy John, he said, we're talking about similar topic. God's big. And he goes, I don't know if you know this story, but Nick was sitting alone in a room with Benjamin Netanyahu. Okay? Not too long ago. They're in a room together alone, talking. And Nick, you have to know Nick. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. He literally was pleading with Netanyahu. This, this, this is live. This happened. And he said to former prime minister of Israel, still political power, and says, I don't know why you, right, not pointing, I don't know why you don't just sit with the president of the Palestinian state, the two of you alone in a room, and solve this thing. <laughs> he said that. And Benjamin goes, well, you know, it's not that easy. He goes, it is that easy. It is that no cameras, no assistance, the two of you alone in a room, man to man, and solve this thing because the two of you could do it. Is that unbelievable? That is a guy who is physically limited, who has no limits on God at all. And John and I were sitting over a Starbucks coffee and we're laughing about it. And I said, he goes, no, Nick was real. I said, no, 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 I know Nick now. He really was that bold. To the point where Netanyahu goes, yeah, you're, you're probably right. You're probably right. It's a lot more difficult than that sounds. He goes, yeah, but it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Isn't this crazy? Do you, can you imagine in the world what would happen if that happened? And God's going, oh, yeah, not that big of a deal. God's like, oh, I don't know. Could I put two people in the same room together? Boy, it takes some logistics. He goes, no, I can do that. We dream. We take a passage. Ephesians 5 says, love like God loves. Be an imitator of God as God's children and live a life of love. That's what your kids need. They need a grandparent and a parent and an uncle and a brother that is every day saying, God, I pray that my kids or my brother would love people. Make them a lover of you and a lover of people. It's your scriptures. It's your desire, and I'm praying this in the life of my kid. And whether he's in jail, driving a truck as a custodian or a huge office, it means nothing. It means nothing. I want this in his life. Who's praying for one another this way? Praying for this community. This community is in desperate need of Jesus Christ, and it's us to step up and go, I pray that you start with city council, and you go to the mayor, and work your way through, and I'm begging with you, God. You said it's your will that all would be saved, and I'm claiming that for this town. And use us any way you want. Have us implode, whatever you want. You want us off the map and use somebody else? It doesn't matter. I just want this to happen. Do what you want through us. 
I don't want us to change our prayers. Keep praying for the health of your kids. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is going to be. But I'm asking, though, that we would consider enlarging our prayers. God can use us as a body, you as a person. He already has. But how about bigger? How about more? How about limitless? Because God has the ability to do that. We're just not asking. Would you pray with me right now? begins in a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, it has to start there. Only access to God is through faith in Jesus. And then for the rest of us, let's enlarge. Don't think about the theology of it. Just enlarge your prayers. God will sort out. And we're asking, Heavenly Father, that you would use us to reach this community, that you would use us in each of our families to pray God-sized, you-sized prayers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.